Sub Freaks, it's your boy Marty here to introduce Rip 353 of TFTC with our very good old friend, Whitney Webb. She just released a book, One Nation Under Blackmail, two volumes, very dense, filled with information about the intermingling of the intelligence agencies and organized crime throughout the last five decades. Highly recommend you freaks pick it up. It will be sitting in the TFTC Studios bookshelf in Austin, Texas uh, within the next couple of weeks. Um, yeah, I mean, Whitney's one of my favorite guests, one of the uh, bravest individuals we've had on the show. The stuff she's reporting on, many people don't want to touch. And the fact that she goes there and uh, not only goes there, but has very well-sourced information that really makes it hard to deny that this type of corruption is going on uh, is very brave, very valiant. And hopefully you guys really like this episode, a lot of dense information about what's going on uh, in her book. And then pick up the book, spread the book, and uh, let's unmask the corruption that exists in our world. I think you guys are going to enjoy it. This trip was brought to you by our good friends at Unchained Capital. This episode is going to be posted on Monday, August 22nd. That means you have 17 days to take part of the Drain the Exchange promo that Unchained is running right now. We're draining the exchanges, freaks. Get your coins off of a centralized exchange and into a 2 or 3 multi-sig vault with Unchained. Uh, they're running a deal. Uh, they're waving for the vault product for the concierge onboarding for the vault. They're waving the uh, $1,000 Bitcoin purchase for anybody who doesn't want to do that immediately. Uh, and they're just going with a $250 uh, setup fee and concierge onboarding experience. Uh, if you use the code TFTC, you're going to get $50 off, bring that down to $200. Uh, and they're also uh, dropping uh, the onboarding onto their IRA down to $250 and also offering $50 off uh, that um, that onboarding concierge experience as well uh, using the code TFTC. With the IRA, you'll still have the setup fee if you decide to set it up, um, but their consultations uh, are significantly reduced with this deal. We're draining the exchanges, freaks. It's time. Don't let these centralized third-party exchanges Hold your Bitcoin. You really have Bitcoin IOUs, single points of failure. We've seen Celsius get rugged, Voyager get rugged, 3AC rugged the world. Don't get rugged. Drain the exchange. Make sure that you're holding your own keys unchained and their vault product allow you to do that and have uh, peace of mind. I'm a customer. I'm a happy customer. And I have the peace of mind. Join me in the peace of mind world. Drain the exchange. Promo ends September 8th. Use the code TFTC. You'll get $50 off. Go to unchained.com slash concierge. This was also brought to you by our good friends at Brains. Brains. Brains is here. Uh, just make you a better miner at the end of the day. Uh, they have the Brains OS Plus firmware, which helps you idiot-proof your mining operation. If you have an ASIC that's compatible with Brains OS Plus firmware and you're not using it, you're an idiot because you're leaving sats on the table. If you download Brains OS Plus firmware on an ASIC that's compatible with it, it's going to help you stack more sats. Only idiots don't stack more sats. So Brains is here to help idiot-proof your mining operation. They also have Brains Pool. It'll be officially Brains Pool in about 11 days here. Uh, the oldest mining pool in Bitcoin's existence still going strong. They're working on Stratum V2 to further distribute the mining pool layer. Uh, yeah. Go check it all out, brains.com, B-R-A-I-I-N-S.com. Not only do they have all these products, if you use Brains OS Plus firmware and you're pointing at Brains Pool, 0% pool fees, and then go check out insights.brains.com too uh, for all your mining data uh, and calculator needs. This trip was also brought to you by our good friends at HODL. HODL, HODL, HODL is here to bring you a lending platform that's peer-to-peer, -peer, no KYC, no AML. Uh, what you do is you put your Bitcoin up, as collateral on a two or three multi-sig escrow, you hold one key, your counterparty in the loan holds one key, and HODL HODL holds the third key. Since you have one key, you have visibility into the escrow account so you know that your sats aren't being rehypothecated. And if you're paying your stablecoin loan back plus the interest, you're going to get your sats back at the end of the day. 
yen, Bitcoin up into its three multi-sig escrow as collateral. You get stable coins of return. You go spend those. Uh, and as long as you're paying that back, plus the interest, you're going to get your sats back at the end of the day. Reminder, no KYC, no AML. Go to lend.hodlhodl.com. Peer-to-peer, baby. This trip is also brought to you by good friends at Upstream Data. Upstream Data is here uh, to basically take care of your mining needs, needs whether you're an at-home miner or uh, a company that's mining at scale upstream on the oil field at a utility. For the at-home miners, they have their black boxes, which allow you to put miners in a box, mine at your house, outside your house, ideally. Uh, you close the box and it takes care of the sound and it's heat controlled to make sure that your miners aren't burning out. Uh, it really is a much needed uh, tool if you're mining at home, especially if you're worried about your wife or your HOA being concerned about the noise. ASICs are really loud. They go, <laughs> put the ASICs in the black box. You close the black box and it goes from <laughs> to it's a beautiful thing. Use the code freaks. You'll get 5% off a black box. Uh, and they're also selling black box bundles. If you want to get ASICs as well, Upstream will help you do that. Go to shop.upstreamdata.ca to check out the black box. And then on the back end, if you're an industrial miner, if you're an oil and gas operator, utility company, who's making a lot of profits as energy prices are going up, you're looking to diversify into uh, an alternative revenue stream. Uh, Bitcoin mining is there for you. And Upstream Data is here to build out the infrastructure for you. You'll get the data centers, you'll get the generators, you'll get the miners. I'm a happy customer of their hash shot. I have a 50 kilowatt hash shot that's been running flawlessly uh, for many months now, at least uh, coming up on a year. Uh, no problems at all, just have to change the oil. Uh, Steve just posted a picture of their first ever Bitcoin mine that got released in the oil field five years ago, still producing Bitcoin today, uh, still chugging where it was initially launched. Uh, it, these things are very durable. Upstream's building with miners in mind. They know what they're doing. Very high quality product. Uh, go to upstreamdata.ca, tell them that TFTC sent you if you're going to get a hash hut. Last but not least, this rip was brought to you by our good friends at Join Crowd Health. Or excuse me, Crowd Health. You go to joincrowdhealth.com slash TFTC. You'll see the special deal that we have running with them, which is if you use the code TFTC, you're going to get your first six months of payments for your Crowd Health community uh, down to $99 a month. It's a significant discount. And what, what are we doing here? Crowd Health is an alternative to health insurance. It's not health insurance, so it's uh, community funded health care. So what you do is you sign up for a Crowd Health account, like I, my family did. Uh, and you pay a monthly fee and that goes into a dedicated bank account that you control and you can always uh, take the money out of whenever you see fit. Uh, you build that account up. If you ever have a medical expense, you tell CrowdHealth, hey, I'm going to the doctor. They say, all right, get the bill, show it to us. You, you get the bill, you show it to CrowdHealth. They go, they negotiate with the, the doctor. And then if you do have to pay an expense, all you do is you pay the first $500 and then uh, the bill goes out to the community and then gets crowdsourced. You get CrowdHealth. 100% of the, the bills that have come to Crowd Health have been funded by the community. Um, and again, I think this is a, a beautiful way to uh, have more sovereign, more transparent interactions with the healthcare system. The fact that uh, you have a dedicated health advocate at Crowd Health is really reassuring. I have one person that I talk to in regards to my family uh, when we're doing um, any of our healthcare needs. I, I'm able to hit up Maggie, say, hey, uh, here's what we need. How can like how should we go about this? And they're there. It's personal. It's not just some call center. It's not a black box like health insurance. They're there to fight for you to lower your healthcare costs. At the end of the day, it's a very uh, incredible model, in my opinion. I'm very happy to be a Crowd Health customer myself. Uh, go to joincrowdhealth.com/tftc to check it out and see how it all works. Enjoy this rip, freaks. Whitney, it's a fucking warrior. Take care. You've had a dynamic where money's become freer than free. If you talk about a Fed just gone nuts, all, all the central banks going nuts. So it's all acting like safe haven. I believe that in a world where central bankers are tripping over themselves to devalue their currency, Bitcoin wins. In the world of fiat currencies, Bitcoin is the victor. I mean, that's part of the bull case for Bitcoin. If you're not paying attention, you probably should be. Probably should be. Oh, we're recording already. Whitney, throwing this together last minute, but I'm happy we are. Lex Wexner, uh, Leslie Wexner, possessed by, by a demon. Uh, you wrote about it in your book. That is coming out soon. 
one nation under blackmail. I've been talking a lot about the fact that it seems like here in the United States specifically, maybe globally, it feels like uh, us citizens, us plebs, us subjects, whatever you want to call us, we've been subject to some weird humiliation rituals from demonic forces. And uh, you're writing about uh, the background of some of the people associated with Jeffrey uh, Epstein, particularly Leslie Wexner in your book. And he actually came out and said, hey, I'm possessed by a demon. So happy we're talking right now. Yeah. So I'm not trying to get into like the spiritual stuff, you know, of this. The idea is that, you know, I made the book like really well sourced, like really primary sources, mainstream media, congressional reports, police reports, all of that type of stuff is the sourcing of the book. Yeah. So I don't really get in like, um, you know, too, too out there. Cause I'm trying to appeal to people that like, uh, well, I would say normies. Yeah. Because if you think about it, if you go and talk to someone who's like not into this stuff normally, and you go like, yeah, the CIA does horrible stuff. And if you're like the CIA does horrible, did horrible stuff in the fifties, they'll be like, oh yeah. Okay. I believe you. You know, they did horrible shit in the 60s. Oh, yeah, okay, I believe you. The 70s, you know, and once you start to get to the 80s and 90s or like now, people start to be like, hmm, I think you might be a conspiracy theorist. I don't know how I feel about this, <laughs> you know? So basically, the the book is trying to like walk people from provable shit that these guys have done that is very bad from way back then when people are more like amenable to believing it when it's really well sourced, especially, um, and, and, you know, through the years to, you know, through Epstein, who is obviously a figure of, of public interest and who pretty much everyone has heard of and everyone knows is bad. We all agree he's bad, right? Even mainstream so. media I, I will we, agree with us there. I hope we can all agree <laughs> yeah. that he's bad. Yeah. So the stuff about Wexner, right, um, that you just brought up. So he has the weirdest freaking article came out about him in New York Magazine of all places in 1985. It's called um, like On Pins and Needles with Leslie Wexner. And that's a reference to his uh, demon. He uses the Yiddish term, uh, the book, which is basically is usually translated into English as demon. And if you go and look in, in various um, Jewish encyclopedias or, you know, websites like the Jewish Chronicle or even, you know, just uh, general uh, reference, uh, you know, sources of reference, like, I don't know, Encyclopedia Britannica or something like that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's consistently across the board defined, defined as like a negative spiritual possession, negative meaning it's like not a good spirit. Yeah. And the way it's often described is um, the soul of uh, or spirit of a person who committed many bad sins in their life. And that prevents them from moving on to the afterlife. The fact that they are so like dirty, basically. And so they cling, they, they go and stick or cling to a living person. And, and that's what Wexner openly talks about having a relationship with. And I don't know if you uh, read my article on it. Uh, which is pretty short. Yeah. Or uh, you read the New York magazine article itself, but that New York magazine article basically like brags about it. Um, and the pins and needles reference in the title is how Wexner describes how he feels constantly being uh, poked and prodded by his de book, uh, which, which compels him to um, gobble up more and more companies and accumulate more wealth and power for himself um, he describes the, the book as a separate entity uh, that uh, is an integral part of his genius, he says. Um, and it, he claims it was uh, joined with him as a child, uh, mm -hmm. went away during an unspecified amount of time. And then around the time he was very wealthy, I think uh, halfway to becoming a billionaire, roughly around there, I guess, uh, 1979, I think is the year he says it came back into his life. He, uh, has long had a vacation property in Colorado, uh, around Vail, I believe. And he was climbing up a mountain near there and apparently like had a near death experience. Um, I guess climbed too far up the mountain for his own good or something like that. And I guess, uh, he claims that this entity, 
uh, cling clung to him yet again at that time. Like he sort of like made a deal. It sounds like he made like a deal with the devil. You know what I mean? Like get me out of this. Uh, don't let me freeze to death. And you know, you can, I'll do anything you say. Type. I mean, it, it's, it comes across like that. Right. And the weird thing is the author of this article and New York Magazine, which is like nationally read, you know, <laughs> it's like not just an, it's not like an obscure thing, um, references it repeatedly. I mean, it's like a, the main, one of the main themes throughout this whole like multi page article, which was like the feature article for that particular issue for New York Magazine. And it has all these pictures of Leslie Wexter being like, yeah, with, with like women around him, you know? And then if you actually read the text, it's like, I'm possessed by a demon. Uh, I mean, it's really, it's just, I mean, I don't mean to like laugh at it, but it's just so absurd. It's, it, it's really fucked up is, is what it is. Um, those, you know, because this is a guy. Well, yeah. So think, think about it this way. Le Leslie Wexner's philanthropy, which by the way, Jeffrey Epstein was really, in, really involved with um, from the, the late eighties, you know, pretty much onward um, is, is focused on, developing leaders, you know, sort of like the young global leaders program, which by the way, I, I, in a recent article I put out, which is an excerpt from the book, there are intersections between, uh, the young global leaders program of the WEF and, uh, Leslie Wexner's, uh, you know, leader training efforts. So, um, and actually, uh, at that, that video where, where Klaus Schwab goes, we will penetrate the cabinets and all that stuff that, that mm -hmm. went viral. Yeah, he's he's talking at a center that that Wexner almost exclusively finances and found it was founded with his money at Harvard and uh, who he handpicked the head of that center, uh, which is David Gergen, who's, you know, the guy in that video with Klaus Schwab. And uh, it, that center hosts the Young Global Leaders Summer Seminars and stuff. Um, but anyway, uh, Wexner before then, uh, since the eighties has been ex almost exclusively focused on training young global leaders, either in the North American Jewish community or in Israel's, uh, government. Uh, well, a lot of people in Israel's government, but also it's national security apparatus and, and it's banking sector, the private sector, um, stuff like that. Um, you know, training people who then become leaders, whatever. So, um, think about it this way. If someone is, um, training, I don't know, Catholic clergy who get a, who get a, you know, a, a fast track to the highest levels of the Vatican, a person who's like training all those guys it openly says he's possessed by a demon or possessed by Satan, right? Yeah. How would people react to that? Okay, Th this is Leslie Wexner. I it's the same situation. There's been, and not only do you have this crazy admission, right, of, of his like spiritual affliction or mental illness or, you know, however you want to look at it, because he openly says, I basically have like two personalities. I have like the stunted uh, boy son part of myself and I have the, the book that's dominant. I mean, he basically says it's in the yeah. article. Go read yeah. it. And towards the end of your article, you say, yeah, he self-identifies as the, the book uh, at that point. Yeah, he says it looks like him and, and, and appears next to him and like tells him what to do and stuff. And is there when he wakes up in the morning and when he goes, I mean, it's just like absurd to read. It's nuts. Um, yes. So it's, that's the guy that bankrolled Epstein, dude. Yeah. And so let's, let's go more into your book. I mean, the, the subtitle of the book is the sordid union between intelligence and organized crime so how you know, you're talking about leslie wexner the fact that yeah. he's uh, openly saying that he's possessed by some some demon some to book uh he uh, very publicly financed jeffrey epstein is running all these organizations these foundations around the world at harvard one of the most prestigious universities here in the united states what type of influence did this ring of people we'll start with leslie wexner and epstein who are sort of tied at the hip uh have with the yeah. u.s intelligence community or global well, the yeah so the most obvious thing we can see is southern air transport which was like the cia before it you know pumped and dumped and destroyed itself um at the end of the 1990s it, it so th this airline has a really long history 
It goes back to civil air transport, and that later became Air America, you know, the CIA-owned airline that was involved in, you know, drug running and illegal shit uh, for decades and decades and decades. And in the 1980s, of course, it was the airline, you know, connected to Iran-Contra stuff, Mm -hmm. which is arms smuggling, drug smuggling, and, and, you know, other types of illegal activity. Um, so that continued also through the Gulf War in the early 90s. And then a couple of years after that, it becomes basically the exclusive courier of stuff for the limited Leslie Wexner's company. Um, along in this, you know, intimately involved Jeffrey Epstein, who was handling most of logistics for Wexner's bu- business in- uh, interests at the time. The effort to court Southern Air Transport began in 1993. Uh, They were courting both Southern Air Transport and another airline linked to the CIA called Aero Air uh, that was involved with uh, gun running, drug smuggling, and also BCCI, the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, which is like an intelligence-linked bank, uh, involved not just in money laundering and financial crimes, but also sex trafficking uh, and, and a ton of other stuff, really crazy Uh, bank to look into. So you have them starting to court two airlines there. Um, At the same time, the the Limited starts to hire pilots uh, from a company called Executive Jet Aviation, which was the very company used by Larry King of the Franklin scandal uh, to uh, move children around the United States, uh, if you're familiar with that. Um, So... That's pretty nuts in and of itself. And then by 1995, uh, Southern Air Transport relocates to Columbus, Ohio, at the behest of the Limited to run cargo for them. And they only really moved because thanks to Wexner's political connections in Ohio, um, he was able to secure an attractive financing package for their relocation. Yeah. Yeah, He's he's Um, from Ohio, right? He's based in Ohio. Yeah, but I want to say he's like exclusively there. I mean, he's a pretty uh, well-connected, very wealthy dude. So uh, anyway, Southern Air Transport, when it relocated to Columbus, they were top people in Ohio state government, like it's inspector general. I think one of the top law enforcement officials, they told some local journalists, uh, one of them called it the Mayor Lansky run, basically saying that it was um, linked to some sort of criminal activity, the Southern Air Transport limited partnership. And um, other people um, said that it was most likely that Wexner and Epstein were doing some shit with the CIA. Um, And, you know, there's a history of these airlines doing weird stuff domestically in the U.S. Look no further than, you know, Southern Air Transport in in Mena, Arkansas, um, when Bill Clinton was governor and stuff like that with Barry Seal and the Contras and all of that stuff. Um, If you're not familiar with that, I would encourage you to buy volume one of my book that explains all of this stuff like before Epstein, because it helps sort of flesh out, you know, what's what's really going on here. Um, But Southern Air Transport was running cargo from Hong Kong to Columbus. And it's hard to know exactly what um, they were moving, but a bunch of people thought it was really suspicious. I think I finally figured it out. And a lot of it has to do, I think, uh, with who Epstein was meeting with at the White House at the same time that they were getting Southern Air Transport to move over there, which is Mark Middleton. And if you're not familiar with Mark Middleton, uh, in May of this year, uh, he was found hanging from a tree at the uh, ranch of uh, an NGL called Heifer International that's tied to both the Gates Foundation and the Clinton Foundation. So that's fun. Uh, Hanging from a tree with an extension cord around his neck and a shotgun blast to the chest. It ruled a suicide. Um, All photos and media taken at the scene of his death has been blocked by a judge. So um, wait, that was just a couple months after the visitor logs of Middleton and Epstein at the Clinton White House in the mid 90s came out. And it was revealed that what was previously thought to have been five, vi- f- sorry, five visits was really 17, 17 and in less than two years. And all during this time when uh, Epstein is simultaneously involved with Southern Air Transport, which, as I mentioned earlier, had a history in Arkansas when Clinton was governor and was, you know, members of Clinton's inner circle at that time were involved in those operations. Yeah. So you start to look into Mark Middleton. Shit gets really crazy, really fast. I'll give you an example. Um, when George W. Bush became president, do you know the first time he invoked executive privilege? 
Uh, not it was top. just a couple weeks before 9-11, and it was to block all documents being released to Congress about Mark Middleton, who was a Clinton staffer, not a Bush staffer. So why did the Bush family step in to protect Mark Middleton, who left the White House in 1995? Um, what kind of documents was Congress looking to get a hold of, do we know? They're related to the largely forgotten Clinton scandals of the uh, 1996 uh, re-election campaign. The, uh, sus- the, the concern about foreign espionage uh, financing of the Clinton campaign in 1996. And that shit is totally mental also. Um, and man... Um, yeah, if you start to look into that, it becomes pretty clear pretty quickly that the Clinton kill list is about like 34 people short of what it really should be. <laughs> why, not even, why? not even joking about that. Um, and it's really crazy. Uh, so I outlined it in the book. Um, it's going to take a, it would take a lot longer than we have today to unpack and there's a lot to talk about. So I'll just basically give, I guess an overview. So mo- a lot of the the focus of that investigation was actually on Chinese espionage in the United States as it relates to the Clinton campaign, but it wasn't, you know, Chinese the Chinese government was involved, but it, the main focus is around a Ola a family of oligarchs that are very influential in Asia in general uh who were based in Indonesia. They're called the Riyadis. Mokhtar Riyadi is the patriarch of that family, and they are longtime uh, Clinton benefactors. Uh, well before this, uh, even going back to when Clinton was governor of Arkansas in the 1980s, and they are business partners of Jackson Stevens, who bankrolled um, not just Clinton, but also Bush Sr., um, and was very much involved with uh, the aforementioned BCCI the intelligence-linked super suspect bank, um, and just linked to a lot of really suspect activity in general, um, Jackson Stevens. And a lot of people uh, in the Clinton power nexus during that time in Arkansas, um, which is centered, I guess, around the Rose Law Firm, have a lot of ties to Jackson Stevens. As, you know, Rose Law Firm basically represented most of Jackson Stevens' companies, Um, and people who later were prominently placed in the Clinton administration, like Webster Hubble and Vince Foster, all of whom met, uh, oh, am I still here? Oh yeah. Who, both of whom met, um, unfortunate, I guess, uh, ends to their political careers, though very different types of ends. Uh, Vince Foster died under very suspicious circumstances. Webster Hubble was, you know, had to resign. Uh, in related to the the white water scandals and stuff. But um, anyway, this China gate stuff is it's sometimes called uh, centers around the Riyadi family really. Um, but the Riyadi families in the beginning of the 1990s started to basically become not just business partners of Jackson Stevens, but business partners of um, Chinese corporations that were run by the so-called princelings, which are like the um, children of the communist party elite who, um, you know, basically dominate a lot of sort of the more capitalist enterprises uh, that are that have sort of like state involvement uh, in China, including weapons companies. Um, So anyway, uh, the main guy, most of the co-conspirators in China Gate, the people they were meeting with uh, was Mark Middleton. Why Epstein's also meeting with them. So you have a bunch of people that later get accused by Congress of being spies for China, but several of them are actually more like spies for the Riyadi family than they are for China, right? But there are a lot of connections to the Chinese government there. And at the same time, you have people uh, people like Epstein, but also people in the broader Maxwell network, I guess you could call it, Robert Maxwell and... Uh, people that were sort of his business associates also being involved in this campaign scandal uh, at the same time. So you have basically people adjacent to Israeli intelligence and Chinese intelligence circling around the stuff at the same time. And uh, so where does Southern air transport comes in? Well, it turns out, (laughs) this is so nuts. It it, it turns out that basically um, there was uh, a policy put in place 
um, by Clinton in 1994 that bans the importation of Chinese weapons into the United States. And somehow those weapons kept coming into the United States and were basically um, being funneled to gangs in, on the West Coast and East Coast during, you know, uh, when gang violence was particularly bad. Um, so basically, you know, if you're familiar with Gary Webb's work in Dark Alliance, uh, intelligence was funneling crack and other stuff into inner cities. Uh, they were also funneling weapons, apparently, that were cheap and made in China. Uh, so that's what it looks like. And Southern Air Transport, I think, was being used by that time to funnel weapons because the same weapons companies, before it, Southern Air Transport relocated um, to Columbus, um, well, they got busted for smuggling it into the U.S., uh, through all these guys that were also tied up with this China gate stuff. And mm -hmm. Epstein in the 1980s had had a relationship uh, and his mentor, Douglas Lee, did too, uh, with one of these state-owned Chinese companies that was small up in the United States. And so the on Columbus route starts after they already get like, busted. And, uh, spilled bean and, like like ruined the ATF raid on these guys. Um, like um, like tipped off going arrest that had time by state government tipped Maybe off up a little bit. No one really knows what happened, but you have all. Am I still here? You're still here, but you're breaking up a little bit. Um. Seems like the deep state. I'm talking about some pretty wild stuff, so <laughs> I can't say I'm surprised. Um, but I got, I mean, what I picked up, the did I hear the ATF was involved in some way? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me now, or am I still like... Yeah, I can hear you now. Here. Yeah, you're coming. Okay, so yeah, there was this, you can look it up. Um, it was called Dragon, Operation Dragonfire, I guess kind of a cheesy name, you know, how the government is. So that was the ATF operation. And I think Vanity Fair and some other places wrote about it. But yeah, it was tipped off. Uh, they, they tipped off the people they were going to arrest, the highest ranking people. And one of the highest ranking people they were planning to arrest was the guy who managed the North American businesses for this Chinese weapons dealer who the... China Gate people um, had arranged to meet with Clinton, um, and apparently that meeting was related to the uh, tip-off about this weapon smuggling stuff. So it seems like it was related to weapon stuff, but at the same time, it also looks like it was really related to efforts to um, uh, change Commerce Department policy uh, as it relates to import and export, not just of like weapons, but also of technology. And it looks like there was a lot of really illegal technology transfers going on during this period of time to China specifically with sort of Israel as, as an immediate. And if you look in the New York Times, like as 1993, you had like top intelligence officials saying Israel's passing all of the tech military stuff we share with them as part of our quote unquote special relationship. With Israel, Israel passes it all to China, and they're not supposed to do that, And but they're never investigated for it, basically. So, yeah, there's a lot of crazy shit and intrigue uh, in that whole thing, and so I think that's a pretty um, insane indication of the networks in which Epstein and, and Wexner swim, but so you have the CIA airline in the mix. A lot of other of the logistic companies that work for the limited uh, like the, one of the main ones throughout the 1980s until it, uh, went bankrupt when it was under investigation for under, under organized crime ties, uh, was Walsh trucking, which is run by this guy named Frank Walsh, uh, who is a like known criminal. And he's, it, there's like this Columbus, uh, Ohio police report, uh, related to the murder of a tax attorney that was working for Wexner at the time he was murdered. And uh, they tried to destroy this document, the like high the police chief. Uh, but he it somehow like came it, it wasn't destroyed. I don't know how, but it, I'm, I'm glad we have it because it basically talks about all of Wexner's organized crime ties throughout the 1980s um, around the time it was. Uh, well, it was written in 1991. 
I guess. So that's by that point, uh, you know, uh, Epstein had become his money manager, but it's talking about his tie at Wexner's ties around the time he met Epstein, right? Uh, in 1987 or 1985, depending on who you believe the murder of this lawyer happened in 1985. Um, so anyway, that report points out that the main logistics company for the limited at the time was deeply in, in bed with organized crime whilst trucking. And it was under federal investigation for organized crime ties, but that investigation went boop. Uh, and it turns out that all the correspondence sent to Walsh Trucking in, in connection with that investigation, the address was one limited parkway, which is the same address as limiter, uh, as the limited like HQ, you know? So, (laughs) I mean, basically seems like it was, you could almost argue it was like a subsidiary of Wexner's uh, own business empire because it was, you know, located at the same place. Um, Yeah. This is all. So Wexner's a dirty guy. There's a lot more organized crime stuff for him too. Um, Like some of his business associates and stuff. Also his business mentors who he called his business rabbis. Um, also have a history of associating with organized crime people or one of them went to prison uh, for rigging a Sotheby's uh, auction house um, auctions for an antitrust case and stuff. Yeah. I was, I was never aware of this uh, China gate espionage stuff. It's fucking nuts. And it's amazing where people don't know about it because I mean, it's like so seriously shady. Anyway, the Mark Middleton role in that is what George W. Bush blocked. Yes. But it's even crazier than you think. It's even crazier than you think because the main focus, one of the main people these guys were targeting was Ron Brown of the Commerce Department. And then right when all this stuff is starting to explode and be investigated, Ron Brown dies in the shadiest plane crash ever with 34 people who were all part of the same part of the Commerce Department that were being targeted by these guys. They all end up dead in the same plane being, crash. Being targeted by? Uh, <clears throat> the, the, the China Congress? people. The, um, okay. the oh, espionage okay. stuff. Okay. And they so- were all trying to affect Commerce Department policy. Um, and they tried to get stuff like a transfer of military technology approval for that moved to the commerce department. Mm. Uh, and, and Ron Brown was like super sold out. It's kind of funny. Cause he looks like, he looks just like Lando Calrissian. <laughs> um, <laughs> so when I was looking at pictures of him, I was like, Oh, Lando, uh, you know, uh, you've been down this road before. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but anyway, um, <laughs> Um, he does look like Billy Dee Williams. It's true. So, uh, um, anyway, but the, the plane crash was really sus. Yeah. Because supposedly it was blamed on a navigational error, but the, the plane crash in Croatia. Yeah. But then the navigational error, uh, right. The head of navigation of this airport in Croatia, where they were supposed to be flying to was found shot in the chest two days later after the crash. And that was also ruled a suicide. I love uh, it. Just yeah, a lot of weird stuff. Suicide, they usually shoot themselves. Yeah, in the chest. but also it's not just the plane crash. Ron Brown's body found at the plane crash had a weird hole in his head that wasn't caused by the plane crash, and it was very clearly a bullet wound. And you know they did an autopsy, and there were X-rays taken, and then the X-rays apparently showed a lead snowstorm, like the bullet fragmented in a bunch of pieces and just you know, went all over the place and, and then the x-rays were destroyed and no one's seen them since. Um, and, and I mean, there's a ton of stuff. Apparently Ron Brown was going to cooperate with an investigation into some of this stuff and and then was, uh, asked unexpectedly, uh, to go on a trade mission to Croatia. And then he doesn't come back home and then he doesn't cooperate with the investigation because he's dead. (sighs) So at this time, uh, or, before this time, like in the late nineties, when Epstein was meeting with Middleton, uh, what was reported to be five times, but turned out to be 17 times. Like what? 17. What was he being like written down as like, like why was he he was coming with women too? He was coming with young women every time, young, attractive women, every time a different woman, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all supposedly his girlfriends concurrently all you know, the Hugh Hefner model, I would Mm -hmm. call it. Mm hmm. And so, and on one of these occasions, Mark Middleton comes with Epstein 
flies on his plane to Florida and then flies with him from Florida to the Bahamas, uh, apparently going to Epstein's, Epstein's Island, I would assume. Uh, he's going with him James. to the Caribbean. So they go meet at the White House and then Mark comes with, with Jeffrey down to the Caribbean for, I'm sure, just fun times. Uh, they were accompanied by a woman named Jennifer Driver, who no one knows anything about probably an alias. But anyway, in, in the Palm Beach residence, when it was raided, there were pictures of Epstein at the, at the White House podium, like for press conferences and stuff. Uh, and he's with a different woman in both of those pictures. And no one knows who the, who the women are. One of the women was Ghislaine Maxwell. One was a Norwegian heiress that he was dating, who later goes on to be Donald Trump's girlfriend before Melania. Um, another one uh, ended up marrying some really shady oil trader tied to intimately tied to uh some of the shadiest figures in u.s intelligence ever named john doyce i think is how you pronounce his name and he has a lot of connections with uh with epstein's network including some of the weird foreign currency trading that epstein was known to be doing throughout mm -hmm. this period that's another major uh, subtext of the book is all the financial shit epstein is just tied over and over again to a, a slew of financial crimes including uh, basically the collapse of Bear Cerns in 2008, which I did not get to go into the book because it got too long. Uh, but hopefully some other point I'll, I'll be looking into that because, I mean, if true, that's pretty crazy. We can see history, the intelligence ties, and then he goes and basically collapses Bear Stearns, which basically leads to the 2008 economic crisis. Wouldn't that be nuts? Um, anyway, yeah. on, on the UNS review, someone published an article about a lot of that stuff that I've seen in the collapse of Bear Stearns for people that want to go look for that because it's, uh, it's pretty nuts. Yeah. But anyway, I think there's a reason they want people just so specifically focused on a very narrow window of Epstein's life and his activities. You know, uh, most of the focus is around like the early 2000s sex trafficking um, and, you know, the victims that were highlighted by the Miami Herald. And that's really where the only place anyone really wants to go. And it's all about the sex crimes. Nothing about the financial crimes. And what's crazy is that if you think about the investigation or attempted investigation into Epstein's financial crimes, that's the only time where someone innocent in, in these cases has been killed. So you have, you know, Epstein getting suicided. You have John uh, Luke Brunel, one of his uh, co-conspirators in the sex trafficking stuff, uh, being suicided in France. Uh, but when it came to Epstein and the Deutsche Bank court case investigating his connection with Deutsche Bank, uh, the judge's son gets shot and murdered in his home. And it Is was supposed to be a hit one? on the judge. Yeah, I think so. Uh, Esther Salas was the judge and it was her son yeah. that was shot. By a guy that used to work for Kroll, uh, Kroll Associates, uh, which also pops up in the book repeatedly. He was pretending to be a FedEx driver or something like that, right? Knocked on the something door. Something like that. Well, that's the official story. It wasn't, you know, the guy was found dead too. So who really knows if it was him? But if it was him, you know, the Kroll Associates history is a little, mm -hmm, you yeah. know. So, sucks. I mean, what you're going all the way back to the 80s with Leslie Wexner. Uh, the airline, the, uh, the yeah, delivery. there's there's also more if you want to talk about Epstein and intelligence. I just sort of went over the Wexner well, stuff. Yeah, well, I want to go over all the, the what I really want to get at here is like what you're describing, like flooding guns into gangland here in America to incite. I had crime. to do more more research on on some of that too. I mean, I put a lot of it in the book, but it turns out that it was a lot more extensive than I think even Congress got a hold of. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see where that rabbit hole goes. But yeah, I think there's a lot to come out about Epstein. And there's a reason that they don't want um, you looking beyond the, the sex trafficking stuff. Well, that's the point um, of trying to get to, like, what, <laughs> like how much influence, how much do they control? You're talking about like notorious gang violence here in the United States in the 90s, yeah. crack epidemic here in the United States, intermingling of the intelligence agencies internationally and this weird mm -hmm, crime mm -hmm. that exists. And then we're mentioning Clinton. It's, yeah. Bush, so it's see, a, in your heads mm -hmm. more than anything with these people really yeah. controlling things in the background. So I would argue that the Bush and Clintons are really part of the same crime family at the end of the day. They may seem like they're in different political parties, but if you look through their history, I mean, there's a lot of connections. Um, 
like I mentioned earlier, you know, Iran Contra happened really, you know, when George uh, Bush Sr. was vice president. And you could argue pretty easily that after the attempted hit on Ronald Reagan's life in the early 80s, uh, George Bush was basically in charge of most things <laughs> after that. And then, you know, he really had three terms as president, Bush Sr. Um, and, you know, with, with Iran Contra and stuff, I mean, you had the Clintons tied up in that too. And it looks like what was going on around this stuff in the mid nineties, all swirling around Mark Middleton, uh, was basically the Clinton administration's version of Iran Contra. And, and that's mental. And it's mental that it hasn't come out yet, that it had to like, you know, uh, take Jeffrey Epstein to sort of put those pieces together. You know what I mean? Yeah. But what's yeah, like, what's particularly crazy about it, and um, this is why I think people should really buy volume one of the book if they want to understand this part of the of the scandals here. Um, there's there was a company tied to what I call in the book a private CIA, which was a lot of these uh, CIA guys, six blackmailers, and really shady dudes, uh, basically trying to get circumvent efforts under the Carter administration to sort of get the CIA a little more under control. And they basically set up a private CIA that went out of control really fast and was tied up with the, the same intelligence network that later became in, you know, the leadership of the CIA under Bill Casey um, with Reagan. But one of the guys in this network is a guy named John Singlob, and he had a company called Geomilitech. Uh, which was really tied up with the U.S. and Israel. And when the Iran-Contra hearings happened, uh, there was re the revelation about some plan that was discussed between geomilitech representatives and Bill Casey when he was CIA director that was basically about um, the U.S. would give, uh, a, it's like a three-way trading scheme between the U.S., Israel, and China involving weapons and technology transfers. And one thing I should say about Geomilitech is that they did business with Robert Maxwell and his arms trading stuff as it relates to Iran-Contra. Then you have basically Robert Maxwell's successor in many ways, Jeffrey Epstein, at the center of what appears to be that exact plan taking place in the Clinton era. And that's mental. Um, so yeah, buy my books. Let's have a discussion about it. Now. <laughs> but I mean, eventually you'll be able to and, you know, I'm sure someone will pirate the book and put it online, you know, whatever. So <laughs> you can read it then. Yeah. Uh, so the first one comes out at the end uh, in about a month uh, is volume one. And then volume two comes out a month later. So volume one is about this network behind Epstein. And then volume two and all this stuff about Mark Middleton and whatever. That's in volume two. Um, so some people may just want volume two. But you're gonna you're gonna miss out on a lot of the the context that I think helps prove the the thesis of the book if you don't buy volume one, like that geomilitech stuff explaining who the Riyadis are, the Clinton family, Clinton's involvement in Iran Contra, what BCCI was, who Adnan Khashoggi was, who's a really big player here, what the Promise Software scandal was with Robert Maxwell. A lot of the same people involved in Iran Contra were involved in the Promise Software scandal, which is basically the beginning. Uh, it, in a big way of, of you know, subverting uh, technology um, used not just, uh, it was used basically to uh, get a back door into intelligence agencies all over the world. I mean, it was a major intelligence coup, uh, first used by Israel and then later used by the CIA. But the CIA's backdoor version didn't go after global intelligence agencies as much as it went after um, banks, it was all about tracking money and also about uh, it also enabled money laundering on like a huge, huge scale. So anyway, you have to understand a lot of that stuff to understand what Epstein was doing in the in the 1980s, because mm -hmm. if I'm like, uh, you know, it, trying to explain Epstein's intelligence connections to you and I drop lines, names like Ednan Khashoggi, like you have to know who that guy was. You know, I can be like intelligence linked weapons dealer. But if I just, you know, if I simplify it to that. Um, you know, it sort of leaves out the fact that someone like Adnan Khashoggi was tied to Israeli intelligence, U.S. intelligence, U.K. intelligence and Saudi intelligence. And it leaves out a lot of these different um, entity like I mean, there's just a lot of moving parts here. Right. So basically the case I'm making in, in the book when you take both volumes together is that um, Epstein is part of this network that 
has cropped up in various investigations of different scandals through the decades. In Iran Contra, uh, they were they referred to themselves as the Enterprise, which I think is probably a very accurate name for them because this is a business, mm-hmm. and this is a business. Uh, that began when organized crime and intelligence first got together, which formally happened in, during World War II in what is now called Operation Underworld, which was where the Office of Naval Intelligence, with the involvement of the Office of Strategic Services, which is the precursor to the CIA, formally uh, allied, uh, aligned itself. Uh, with organized crime elements, specifically the National Crime Syndicate, which was people uh, basically emerging of the Italian and and Jewish mobs in New York, uh, who by that point had already come to dominate the Democratic Party in New York. And uh, well, yeah, because they took over the unions. And that's part of the reason Operation Underworld happened. They wanted the cooperation of uh, dock workers. And the dock workers union was controlled by the mob. So in order to get to the dock workers, they had to go through the mob. And basically, you know, uh, the idea that organized crime is gone in the U.S. or is a sideshow, no way, dude. Uh, Every time you hear about organized crime people being arrested from the 40s on, it's consolidation. It's these guys that teamed up with intelligence taking out their competition every single time. I mean, you fast forward to today. And we have two prominent figures that are in and out of the news, or one of them's really front and center in the news, which is Bill Gates, and then Larry Summers associated with Jeffrey. Oh, uh, Larry. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's, it seems like it seems like it's more out in the open now. Like, I think what Bill Gates specifically has done is egregiously criminal uh, and continues to do um, in terms of the vaccine rollout and pushing for that. Oh yeah. Okay. There's some crazy stuff in the book about the Gates foundation, the Clinton foundation and and Epstein. Uh, It looks like Epstein basically created the HIV AIDS program that was pursued by both foundations in the early two thousands. And later the Clinton foundation and the Gates foundation teamed up to basically pursue those together at a time when Epstein was meeting with Bill Gates all the time about philanthropy, 36 times that we know about, but they definitely met uh, before the year 2000. Uh, But mainstream media won't touch that, but I've written about that already. Um, and that's also in the book, but you can read a, an article on my site about it. If you just search for Epstein and Gates on my website, Unlimited Hangout, you can find the the article about all of that. Epstein and the Maxwell siblings were very involved with Microsoft throughout the 1990s. Very involved. Um, so the idea that they didn't meet until 2011 is totally clown world. Uh, one example is that the Gates Foundation hired as its science advisor in the early 2000s a girl named Melanie Walker. Uh, Melanie Walker met Epstein in 1992, and he basically invested in and cultivated her uh, for what I think to be like a really sophisticated asset. Because I think in examining his sex trafficking stuff for the book, there's two parallel sex trafficking operations. There's one that we all know about where all these girls on a massive scale were exploited and treated as expendable and abused um, and all of that stuff, right? And then you have another tier where, you know, a a lot of the lure to bring in these girls was promises of help, promises of help with a modeling career, with a music career, with an art career, or financial help, all sorts of stuff, yeah? And so on this other tier, this parallel operation, they're basically offering um, the offers of help actually come through, and they invest a lot of money in these uh, girls as they become women, and then um, they become girlfriends or wives of people in, in Epstein's network. Um, and so Melanie Walker is one of those people. She's now with a Microsoft executive. Um, but um, she was Epstein's science advisor. He was apparently financing her grad school. And she's a neuroscientist now with the Rockefeller Foundation. Mm-hmm. And uh, she, mm-hmm, yeah, which by the way, there's, the uh, lack of reporting on the Epstein Rockefeller ties. That's also in the book, uh, David Rockefeller specifically. So, um, oh, losing my train of thought, Melanie Walker, right? She was 
science advisor to Epstein, and then just a couple of years later is hired to be one of the main science advisors for the Gates Foundation. But think about her resume at the time. How do you go to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, get hired as the top science advisor, and you're like, oh, I was previously advisor to this billionaire, Jeffrey Epstein. At that time, Bill Gates would have had to have known who Jeffrey Epstein was, what kind of science he was interested in to hire his former science advisor. I mean, think about a job interview for that. Yeah. What's your previous experience? I was previously the science advisor for Jeffrey Epstein. You know, you and, okay, you're hired. Has to know Epstein to some extent. But I mean, the other thing with, with Gates and Epstein is that there's British media outlets reporting in 2001. Uh, before Epstein was infamous, he was just a billionaire or financier or whatever at that time, right? Uh, no one was, no one knew about all his naughty stuff. So uh, British media outlets at the time say that Epstein's, um, in 2001, say that Epstein's fortune came from his business links to three people, Leslie Wexner, Donald Trump, and Bill Gates. How could they have said that in 2001 if Jeffrey Epstein didn't know Bill Gates? Yeah. <laughs> that article's never been retracted, by the way. So, um, and Bill Gates didn't complain about it at the time or ever since. Uh, but we're, you know, just believe the New York Times that the first visit between them was 2011. Yeah. Well, it seems like right now Bill Gates is frantically trying to insert himself into everything. Maybe. I don't know. It's like. Yeah. I think it's an ego issue. I think. Is it an ego thing? Because it's just. I don't know. He's He's a little dweeb. He wants to be on top of everyone telling them what to do. I mean, he's a dweeb with like skeletor delusions, you know? I mean, that's what he wants. Um, Yeah. I mean, he was, he was, I forget what publication it was, but a couple of days ago it came out with this inflation reduction act, which is really just a green new deal act in disguise. That's yes. Yeah. Inflation. And he's bragging about his close relationship with mansion, who was the swing boat for this bill. And he's essentially taking yeah. credit for getting it passed um, and really leaning into the climate stuff. And then, yeah, obviously well, that's his next grift for sure. Um, look at a lot of his investments in the U S uh, his catalyst energy, which I think is Gates and Bezos together. There's, uh, uh, if I'm like able to recover quickly from this book, that's a lot of the stuff I'm going to be looking into is a lot of this climate, uh, fuckery and efforts to securitize the natural world. I wrote about it last year. We talked about it a little bit last year and it's advanced a lot more. Now the Canadian government and the UK government and the, in a bunch of wall street banks have come together to securitize the world's oceans. That's going to be fun. Um, yeah. So, um, there's no shortage of, uh, of, you know, the worst people, you know, cashing in over climate change. It's, um, it's, it's well, pretty nuts, the extent no, of, of the fuckery going on with that. And for the people who believe all these narratives, I don't know. Here's a thought experiment for you. If carbon dioxide is the big problem, uh, why doesn't Bill Gates, being the largest private landowner of farmland in the U.S. right now, just reforest it and plant it with trees? Right? Okay. Plants breathe in carbon dioxide and they breathe, you know, they... They exhale oxygen. Uh, why wouldn't you just reforest your uh, your property? Which is, you know, most of the farmland he bought is fallow anyway. It's not in production, so why not just reforest it, right? Yeah, yeah. Common sense. Uh, no, but we're supposed to believe that instead of planting trees, uh, what's really going to save the planet is a carbon tax, carbon markets, um, natural asset corporations. Um, you know, buying bonds in the world's oceans. I mean, if you can't see that for the scam it is, I said this on Twitter before, you might as well just give these billionaires your brain in a bag if you think they care about the planet. Just hand <laughs> it over. No, uh, not there's nothing, for a you while. know. They They're not using it, up. so just give it, go ahead and give it to them, you know. Just pop it open, pull it out. <laughs> yeah, and here, just take it. it. Give me my, my, you know, cricket ration and I'll chomp away. We need to uh, take down Bill Gates. What, like, did you write about by chance like that uh, his at-home computer infrastructure IT guy? Yeah. Engineer guy that, that had a giant uh, video collection of child rape? Yes. Yeah. Uh, he is in the book. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, good. What what is? Can you dive in a little bit into him without giving up too much? Of the uh, uh, I can't remember his name because I wrote that part uh, probably like in May of last year. But I think that's one of the main reasons that Melinda Gates was trying to get Bill Gates away from Jeffrey Epstein. I don't think it's because she was so much grossed out by Epstein. I think she was like, okay, my name is on this foundation and you know, the guy at our house is currently under investigation while you're meeting with a guy who like was arrested for, you know, pedophile sex trafficking in 2006, 2007. And now, you know, our, our guy's about to get nabbed. I mean, it's, it's not going to look good for me. I think that's what the motivation really was. I mean, she claimed like, Oh, I don't, I'm horrified by what he was doing, but you know, keep in mind, uh, in, in January, 2020, you have Cindy McCain, the wife of, John McCain. Yeah. Who uh, there's no like really obvious McCain Epstein tie. Yeah. So, you know, these guys are separated by various degrees of separation at least. Yeah. And she goes and say, we all knew what Epstein was doing. You can go look up the video of her saying that in Mm -hmm. 2020, we all knew what he was doing. They all knew. So if you're even closer than the McCain's were to Epstein, which isn't very close from what I can see. And you're, you know, at the Gates level and you're actually meeting with the guy. How do you not know what he's doing? It's hard because, you know, some of these early articles about Epstein and Maxwell from the early 2000s. I mean, it's, it's even clear from that what's going on. There's a, I think it's from 2003 or 2001, a mainstream media article in, in the UK saying stuff like, uh, Ghislaine Maxwell has weird parties where she invites young girls to her house and she brandishes whips and trains them in sex techniques. In the early 2000s? Yeah, this is like 2003 or 2001. Can't remember the exact year. Before Epstein was arrested. That's going out in the media. These people totally yeah. knew. Oh, well. I mean, Everyone totally knew. I mean, it's a joke like- to say. Go back to the beginning of this mm-hmm. conversation. Leslie Wexner openly talking about being possessed by a demon. The media openly talking about Ghislaine Maxwell uh, teaching people some erotic sex moves with young women. Young girls, it says. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All out in the open. The, 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 out in the open. Mark Middleton murder. I mean, the fact that they that tried shit's to nuts. Him, I mean, shit's the, it, 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 the Middleton stuff is just beyond. I mean, I only really scratched the surface. I'm like not even giving you the detail of the stuff that went on. I mean, well, it's it's you, insane. If you factor, it, it in- honestly has to be one of the worst scandals in the last 30 years, hands down, and hardly anyone knows about it. Like you know, what? I was like six years old at the time it happened, or whatever, like 1996. Well, I was born in '89, but you know. I didn't know what was going on at the time, obviously, but I, I don't know. I think it's been memory hold for people that even did know. And the Vince Foster stuff is also really crazy there uh, in the book is also in an Epstein Vince Foster, you know, connection that is really disturbing. And that's, I think that's all, you know, uh, why Vince Foster had to go. Uh, that's all tied up with the same stuff that was going on with Middleton in the, in the mid nineties. And that just says to me that we don't even really have a full understanding of how corrupt the Clintons are with everything we already do know. Yeah. yeah. Well, that there's more on how just absurdly corrupt they are to come out. But, you know, uh, Oh, another thing I should, I should say. So one of the main guys here of interest and this whole China gate thing that never got properly investigated. Uh, but I mean, he just, he has to be a total insane traitor the way the stuff he was doing with this stuff. He's an American. He is the guy that put, helped put Biden in office this term uh, responsible for his primary win financed him uh, all the way through the Iowa caucus when he was going to have to drop out and uh, you know, basically foisted Joe Biden senile ice cream eating Joy, Joe Biden on America. Um, the same guy that sold out our national security to, uh, to, uh, you know, our supposed top foreign adversary, uh, with all this intrigue of, uh, foreign intelligence agents and the murder of like 34 top officials of the commerce department Who? is the guy that put Biden in power. His name's Bernard Schwartz. Okay. Yeah. Bernard Schwartz. You can look him up. He's really old by now, but, uh, he's still around and still loves to throw his money at, uh, horrible centrist dims uh you know who are basically just like you know 
cookie cutter world economic forum whatever <laughs> you know my mind like going back to middleton like what beans was he about to spill if they hung him and then shot him in the chest with a shotgun and just left him he there? why did they wait until this may to do it i think it has to do with the fact the visitor logs about him and epstein came out and people were going to start looking into who was mark middleton and okay. when you start going down that road of who was mark middleton it gets really crazy really fast and then you see that the bush is the you know child bush you know w w bush steps in his first invocation of you know executive privilege as president is to is to protect this guy who had resigned like five uh, five six ish years prior from the white house left in february 1995 yeah epstein's last visit to the white house was just before mark middleton left in january 1995 he stopped going when middleton was gone because he was meeting mostly with middleton so but his first that. visit his first visit was signed off by Robert Rubin, who became Treasury Secretary and whose deputy was Larry Summers. And while Larry Summers is Robert Rubin's deputy, he's flying on Epstein's plane uh, way before he becomes president of Harvard. And another crazy thing about Robert Rubin, before he was in that position where he brought in Epstein to the White House, he was, uh, I think at that time, he was head of the National Economic Council or something like that. But before he was in the Clinton administration, Robert Rubin was head of Goldman Sachs at the exact time that Goldman Sachs uh, was taking a ton of heat because of their involvement and Robert Maxwell's illegal business activities and the theft of pension fund money and all of this stuff. Goldman Sachs intimately involved in that and Robert Rubin would have too. So the guy that, you know, was intimately involved in Robert Maxwell's financial crimes brings Jeffrey Epstein to the White House uh, on his first White House visit on... You know, eh, there's a lot more to come out, you know, so I, I, I tried to dig up a lot in my book because I mean, think about all the stuff we've talked about today. Where else have you heard this shit about Jeffrey Epstein? And it's all able to be nowhere. documented. Like I said, uh, my sources for this are either mainstream media, primary sources, uh, congressional investigations, police reports, all kinds of stuff like that. You know, primary, try and debunk me, sources. assholes. In mainstream media, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, how, uh, how is it? Like, have you, I mean, obviously I'm sure people paint you as a conspiracy theorist, but again, you're, you're, with well, sure. Uh, who isn't these days? I don't know. Everyone without myocarditis, I guess. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, that's, I mean, uh, sorry, maybe favorite. that wasn't nice, but no, you I know. mean, I'm not, I don't have to worry about that. So. Uh, no basically you're a conspiracy theorist if you don't believe the government 100 percent of the time if you yeah. don't trust public institutions you're a conspiracy theorist now do you think, uh, that's probably most americans do you think we're getting close to the dam breaking on all this stuff yeah it's gonna happen a part of it is because the same group i wrote about with epstein and in like i mentioned epstein's financial crimes these people have been looting the u.s and also the whole like global economy for decades. And there's a point where their rackets and all their financial schemes are going to collapse, you know, um, like 2008, right. You know, this, the, the structural stuff that happened there never got fixed. It's just been another bubble inflated on top of that popped bubble. Um, and everyone pretty much knows it's a mathematical inevitability that it'll, it'll collapse again. Right. These guys want to manage that collapse. so They don't get in trouble. Their illegal shit they've been doing this whole time with the banking system doesn't get found out. And so they can be in power forever, um, you know, by enslaving the plebs with CBDCs and stuff like that. And that's why you're seeing this major effort to remake the economy, uh, you know, the, uh, under the guise of climate change and whatever else, and a more equitable world where you're all equally enslaved, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> um, you know, but there's a major effort to remake the global economy right at the time this stuff is about to uh, hit the fan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but these people have been taking us to town and looting us for like decades, decades and decades oh. and decades. And most of them, I mean, 
some of the biggest collapses in U.S. history intimately connected this network. Uh, Enron is one, but I don't really go into those connections too much in the book. That's going to have to be a separate thing. Um, but uh, Penn Central, one of the biggest bankruptcies in U.S. history that happened in the, in the 70s, uh, tied up with these guys too. Um, the savings and loan crisis of the 1980s, Drexel, Burnham, Lambert, uh, all of that stuff is here with these guys. Yeah. It's the same dudes. Uh, and that's just on the financial side. And then keep in mind too, Epstein was one of the masterminds of one of the biggest Ponzi schemes in U.S. history at Towers Financial. And then instead of getting prosecuted for that, Steve Hoffenberg takes the fall. Uh, instead of doing that, Epstein goes straight to the White House and starts being involved in Clinton presidential fundraising in 1993, in 1996, and then starts uh, helps create essentially the Clinton Foundation, which is you know their modern day political slush fund. So you have a major financial criminal becoming intimately involved in the Clinton fundraising uh, machine. Uh, you know, after 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 planning the biggest Ponzi scheme when, at that time in U.S. history. There's a it lot to chew on died. there. It all reeks. And when I say the dam breaking, I mean like yeah. people waking up being like, look. Oh, well, that would be nice. I hope my book can do that for people because, I mean, it is it is a documented history of, of how these guys have been fucking us over uh, for a hundred years. I mean, it's basically like uh, going a hundred years back. Um, and most of it focuses, you know, the timeline of the book, I guess, basically stops in the early 2000s, you know. But I do mention some stuff about Epstein that happened later in relation to like Silicon Valley and stuff in that to sort of close out the book. Uh, but there's a, there's a lot to chew on. It's a long history, but we have to know how we got here to know how to fix it. And you can't think that like the excuse that was made in like Watergate and like Iran Contra and stuff. When like some of these scandals come out, they're like, Oh, well you just have to throw the rotten fish out of the barrel, but keep the barrel. You know, the system's not bad. Just some of the, you know, just a few rotten apples, but the rest are all good. You know, it, no, no, don't believe that shit. The whole thing is, 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 you know, it's got to go. Rotten to its um, core. Yeah, to 100%. So where can we find the book? Car, pull okay, back. so Great. I'm guessing most of your uh, audience lives in the continental U.S. So if that's the case, uh, what you're showing on screen is what you should buy if you want both books. Uh, it's the bundle. You get volumes one and two for thirty four ninety five. You can also buy bo both books separately there. Um, but um, I say the continental U.S. because currently for outside or for far from the U.S., um, you know, like Europe, uh, the shipping costs are kind of high and that's out of my hands because, you know, that's just how things are. But we're working with the distributors like in the U.K. and, and other places uh, to make that bundle available for this price over there. So. Um, if you want more information about those different, you know, bundle stuff or, or you know, updates about uh, more information about the book, you can go to my website, unlimitedhangout.com. Uh, and you can, yeah, go to the, <laughs> the page about the book that's right there that you have up. Uh, you can also sign up for the newsletter, uh, unlimitedhangout.com slash newsletter, uh, where you can, you know, all the book day, uh, updates we have, you can, you can look at. And uh, what you're showing there is my most recent podcast. Uh, that basically is me giving an overview of, you know, the structure of, of the book, both volumes, because it was originally written to be one book. It just ended up being so long um, that it got split into two for the physical copy. Uh, the ebook and the audio book, which are both going to be available soon, um, are going to be both volumes together. So that's definitely going to be the most cost effective uh, for most people. So if you want, you know, information on, on that, once it's available, please sign up for the newsletter. Um, but if you want the physical book, which I mean, I personally prefer physical books, then uh, Trying Day is the best place to buy them if you're in the U.S. But there are some, I, I believe, I've heard from people in the U.K., there are some distributors over there um, that are, uh, you know, taking care of the stuff. I worked really hard on these books. Uh, it's like a lot of really detailed research. So I would appreciate, you know, your support by, by buying it. But like I said, you know, the audiobook and ebook are going to come out. That's going to be, um, you know, the best, uh, the most cost effective way for people to like get this material. And honestly, what I care about more than anything else is that just like people read it. <laughs> you know, like I didn't do this because I wanted to like, you know, milk the interest and the Epstein ties. Otherwise I would have written a much shorter book. Like that was more like wham, pow, whoa, whatever. But this is, you know, 
Um, I'm, I'm trying to document how we got here. And, you know, you'll, in, in taking a look at volumes one and two together, you will realize Jeffrey Epstein was in no way an anomaly. There are people littered throughout U.S. history that were just like him. Uh, people like Roy Cohn, people like Edwin Wilson, people like Robert Keith Gray, people like Adnan Khashoggi, all of these guys had sex blackmail, uh, major political power, uh, lots of influence in the private and public sector, ties to organized crime, you name it, it's there, right? Epstein was not an anomaly at all. And that's the mainstream media narrative, right? Is that, oh, he's the, he was the only bad billionaire, but don't worry, our justice system took care of him and he's dead, so don't worry about it. That's what Bill Gates like to, likes to say when he's questioned about Bill Gates now. He's like, well, he's dead, so, <laughs> you know, uh, no, Bill, uh, you're still a dweeb and you're still a creep and it doesn't matter that he's dead. Uh, <laughs> you know, you should be held accountable, even though you're a billionaire. So, you know. Having uh, having chatted with you for the last couple of years, I know, like you said, you've worked extremely hard on this book, a lot of long hours. I mean, the last time we caught up a couple months ago, uh, you were... Uh, In really the middle of the slog, <laughs> if I remember correctly, it was pretty brutal, yeah. I'm very, uh, very happy that everything's uh, finished, it's out there. Uh, go to Unlimited Hangout, check out the book. Uh, one nation under blackmail, the sordid uh, union of intelligence and organized crime that led to the rise of Jeffrey Epstein. I believe I got that correct off the top of my head. Uh, it's more or less. Yeah, totally. I, I mean, that's what the book is. Uh, you, ha you have to know where it started and how it's happened. And it's not just a damning expose, I would say, of, of Epstein. Uh, it's, it's a damning expose of the power structure of our country. Of and the world, arguably. Well, yeah, because the U.S. is an empire, so it has client state that are client states that are controlled by the you know these same entities. In how many countries we have eight hundred military bases around the world? <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah, it's 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 important. I yes, think. It. I hope you also think that <laughs> people watch it. Um, I'm going to pick up the book. Uh, I've already picked up the book. It's coming to TFTC Studios. It will be on our bookshelf in the studio. I'm obviously not there right now. I'm on the back porch. Uh, yeah <laughs> no worries but, um yeah thank you for the work i mean it's always a pleasure catching up with you i think the work that you're doing is very important uh it's very brave work there's not too many people out there willing to do this and no um, but it needs to be done you know i mean we can't just keep sleepwalking into the into insane dystopia indefinitely uh and you know i'm a mom you're a dad I don't think we want the shit for our kids. So, you know, you gotta have to, gotta have to do something about it. And it starts with waking people up because as much as you like prep and off grid and whatever, I mean, I think obviously that's really important because of a lot of the stuff that they're, you know, that's obviously in the works right now and is going to explode not too long in, in the future from now. Uh, but you, you have to have, you know, there's power in numbers, right? And there, there's a reason that they have invested so much in manipulating the public. Um, and, and trying to convince people that our institutions aren't corrupt, why they've been taken over by organized crime and intelligence fusing together and basically becoming the same entity. Um, so, you know, we have to inform people. That's where it starts. Yes. Keep, uh, I think this the first time you're on the show, that's what you said. You, you do this because you want to poke a pen in the eye of the power structure. So keep Yeah, yeah, pen. totally. Well, you know, um, when I lived in the States, I didn't really have it easy. I, you know, one of the reasons I came to Latin America was because it just, life in the States did not go well for me um, as a young person. And, um, you know, eventually you figure out about all this stuff and, and how the world is set up and it's really unfair. And, you know, I do want to stick them in the eye and I want to stick them in the eye, not just because of like my experience, right. But because of like, when you study this stuff, all the people they've killed, all the lives they've destroyed, um, all the people they've screwed over who didn't deserve it. Uh, yeah. I mean, they definitely deserve to be stuck in the eye for being supreme dicks <laughs> on a global <laughs> scale, you know? Well, I think your book's going to do uh, a lot of eye opening, not just uh, your poking. I hope so. I mean, I made an effort to really source this. So like the most normie McNormanton could be like, oh, shit. <laughs> That's like my my ultimate goal.
so I definitely, you know, I didn't, I hardly even referenced my own site or my own work, uh, went as, you know, primary mainstream as I could get to be like, look, <laughs> look, it's true. It's happened. You know, starting back in history when people are more like, uh, it's more accessible to people that this stuff went on and then you show the continuity, you know, you, you can clearly see it didn't stop. Yeah. And it's still going on today just because yeah, Jeffrey, and it's still going died. on. Uh, well, I know you've got to get on with your Friday afternoon here. I do. Uh, I have to go to the dentist. How fun. Uh, <laughs> I haven't been in like <laughs> three years, so I should probably go. <laughs> so, I put I it off while I was writing the book along with a bunch of other shit. So I have to go be a normal person now for a little bit. <laughs> well, I won't enjoy being a normal person again. I know you've been working really hard on this. and uh, uh, Yeah, I, I need to get out of the writing cave and like live again. Good. It'll be nice. <laughs> Feel good to be over the finish line? Yeah, totally. Totally. I mean, I have a little more to do, but I mean, it's just minor stuff, you know, and most of it's, you know, promotional at this point, telling people about the book and where they can find it and whatever. So yeah, it's great to be over the hump. It was really stressful. But then I realized, oh, I know why it's stressful. I was writing two books when, <laughs> at the same time. So yeah, that, that, that'll do it. That'll, that'll you be, to, you know. I mean, uh, this podcast, we're going to get it out to a lot of people, but I think you need to get back on Tim Dillon, spread the message there. Yeah, and I, I, I've I sent a copy of the book to Tim. Uh, he responded, okay. you expect me to read a book? Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> uh, I hope I hope to go back on. That would that would be nice. Um, yeah. And actually, a pretty big YouTube channel, uh, not Rogan size, but up there, uh, reached out. But I have to go in studio, so in the States. So I'm thinking about that. No, I don't live in the ever. U.S. for people that don't know. Uh, I live secluded in the Andes. It's nice <laughs> and quiet. I wonder why they wouldn't make an exception for you. I feel like it would be a meaningful interview to make an exception for. Well, so. we'll see what happens. Um, well, you know, they, they currently don't have remote interview capabilities, and sometimes that happens. It's all right. I'm considering it. Okay. Well, it's not that far from my hometown, so it's not that hard, I guess. If it ends up Go being see in the Texas. Fan. I'm not sure where you're from, but um, Florida from Florida. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's an interesting place. Um, I guess in the COVID era, nicer to visit. Uh, Florida, I think, is one of those places that's like cool to vacation, especially when you have kids. But like I, I having grown up there, I would not live there <laughs> full time. Um, that's what uh, my vacation in Florida last year. It was a great vacation town. Uh, I do not know. Yeah. If I would, I would live there though. I chose Texas over Florida and the great balkanization of the United States. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, so, all right. We'll see what happens. Anyway, Freak. thanks for uh, talking on, on short notice. I uh, appreciate yeah, you yeah. and your show. Nice. I appreciate you and the work that you're doing. If you DM me and say, hey, do you want to record today? And I have nothing to do. I'm <laughs> like, uh, yes, I do. So, all right. Uh, right on. Happy, uh, happy you. Threw that out there. We'll post this on Monday. Freaks, go buy the book. Uh, a nation, one nation under blackmail. Uh, very important work and spread the message. Give it to the, the Normie McNormanton in your life uh, and, and yeah. show them this is well sourced. Whitney, go enjoy the dentist as much as you can. <laughs> well, I want to do some other stuff because it's actually it's like winter here, so it's like finally there's like a sunny day where it's sort of warmish. So I'm gonna do outside stuff and then uh, you know, go to the dentist. <laughs> Enjoy, enjoy I probably shouldn't have even mentioned that, but you know, whatever. Sometimes when people are easy to talk to, you get in like shoot the shit mode after talking about, you know, work stuff. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry for everyone well, that didn't want to know that. Now you know. <laughs> I don't know. The freaks like getting a little inside knowledge into the, the life of Whitney Webb. Uh, <laughs> go right, enjoy. Ruby. I will. All right. You, you all take care. Thanks. Peace and love, freaks. Take care. <laughs>